Hello and welcome to the World Wanderers Podcast, your source for travel stories, travel destinations, and travel philosophy. I'm Amanda. I'm Ryan. And we're your hosts. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Praxis. Praxis is a nine-month apprenticeship program designed for young people who want to kickstart their careers. Now, you may be wondering what this has to do with travel. Well, for us, travel has really inspired us to figure out what we wanted to do with our lives. It's given us ideas and inspiration, and sometimes it's really hard to actually put your ideas into something practical. That's where Praxis comes in. It's a three-month professional boot camp followed by a six-month apprenticeship at a growing startup. If this sounds like something that would interest you, visit www.theworldwanders.com forward slash Praxis and download your first module of the curriculum for free. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the World Wanders podcast. Today, we have an interview with author, traveler, and Greek island expert, Jen Barkley. We were introduced to Jen via a listener of the show, Dina. Dina, thank you so much for the introduction. It was really amazing to talk to Jen, and we're really excited to share Jen's story on this podcast because she is British originally and went to Greece, kind of fell in love with the Greek culture and the food, and then just found herself eventually living there, writing books about the culture and her experiences, and she's on the podcast today to share that with us. Yeah, she has an amazing story overall, but then it's chocked full of other interesting stories. Like she has one about how she ended up moving to the specific island that she lives on now that's fantastic. So as you listen to the episode, you're going to get a lot of entertainment, but we also kind of talk about the practicalities of writing about travel and how you turn interesting moments abroad into stories that people are interested in reading. Yeah, definitely. And so just quickly before we jump into the interview with Jen, a quick reminder that we're hosting free online hangouts with ourselves and cool guests every Tuesday at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. And this Tuesday, June 13th, we're super excited to be joined by Sasha and Rachel, who are on last week's episode of the podcast with us. And they are from Grateful Gypsies. And they're going to be talking about teaching English abroad, sharing some of their experiences doing that, transitioning into teaching English online, what that's like, answering any questions you guys have. So even if you're not interested in teaching English, join us. It's free. It's fun. You can ask them anything about their travels and they're super awesome. So go listen to last week's episode to get a little bit of a feel for that. Without further ado, here's Jen. So we are super excited to be joined by Jen on the podcast today. Jen's joining us all the way from Greece. Thank you so much for being here today, Jen. It's great to be talking to you. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, and so we are super excited to dig into what life is like in Greece and what it's like being a travel writer on the Greek islands, because I think that's a lot of travelers dream. Uh, but we were thinking that a good place to start would be to back up a couple of years and sort of talk about where the idea to move to Greece first came from. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, I'll try not to keep this, I'll try not to tell you my entire life story, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, it did, it does go back quite a long way, um, probably to, to, to be, to childhood, um, because when I was a kid, my brother and I um, were taken on lovely Greek island holidays by my parents. I, they were they were such wonderful times. I mean, my dad says my dad always says that like those were the best times that ever we had as a family. We were those those summer summer holidays that we had together. And so I think that um, you know I always I always loved. Uh, and my parents were always very happy in the sunshine as well. Um, I grew up in the north of England, beautiful beautiful village in the hills in the north of England, but. Um, both my parents really craved sunshine, so we were all really happy when we got to, you know, got to holiday on the Mediterranean. Uh, and my parents weren't weren't rich by any means, but back in those days, um, uh, we're talking now. It would have been sort of the seventies when I first sort of came when I was as a kid to Greece. Um, you could, if from from the UK, they they were very sort of cheap flights to Greece and and. Um, we, we we just have a couple of weeks uh, with beach it swimming and the sea and experiencing the music and the food and I sort of fell in love with all of that right away and the and the and the sort of the and the history as well the history. So I kind of just kept going to Greece on holidays and as I got older I'd sort of spent go 
come to Greece on my own, spend a bit longer. Um, started studying Greek, ancient Greek at school. Um, had a really good teacher who uh, was very inspiring. And I uh, finally finished university. I had actually wanted to study Greek at university, but was sort of persuaded to do something different. When I finished university, I really didn't know what I wanted to do with my English degree. So I came back to Greece and spent a year living, teaching English in Athens. As so many people do when they don't know what they want to do after university with an English degree. And uh, had all the great adventures that um, I'd been missing during three grueling years of university. Um, uh, the great thing about being an English teacher in Athens was um, every weekend I would just go down to um, the port at Piraeus and choose a boat to get on and go to a different island for the weekend. That's amazing. <laughs> I know. And then there's um, and then nice long holidays. So I'd go to Crete um, and I just find find myself somewhere with mountains and sea, uh, far from far from city life. Um, and uh, spent my summer working on Santorini um, uh, with that amazing view. So I mean, I was just I, I, I knew that uh, I, I loved. Greek islands and Greek island life, um, but I also knew that I wasn't being being an, teaching English. It wasn't I, that wasn't what I wanted to do for my career. So then there was a long detour <laughs> where I left Greece and I went to live in Canada. I went to live in Toronto, ended up working in book publishing there, um, which I re- realized pretty quickly that was what I wanted to do was work with books. So I worked as a literary agent in Toronto, then moved back to the, to Europe, moved to France, worked as a freelance editor there, um, moved back to the UK for a while, worked uh, for a book publishing company as a as a commissioning editor for a small an independent publisher in the UK. So then finally I got to the point where I thought, okay, I can, I, I sort of know, I'd worked in publishing for quite a few years by that point um, and figured that I think I was sitting in my office, there were sort of two moments, there were two moments that informed then the decision of what, what to do next. One of them was um, I was on a walk um, in the South Downs, in the south of England, one weekend, and I was walking on the t- on the ridge of the hills, looking out at the spectacular countryside all around, and I thought to myself, this is what's important to me in life. This is what I want to be doing. I don't want to be going up the career ladder anymore. I, this is this is the most important thing. The other moment was sitting in my office, still working for the publishing company, um, and doing my job, um, emailing people uh, in uh, the US, in Australia, in the next office, my colleagues, and realized that everything I was doing was by email. And I thought, well, why can't I just do that from anywhere? We have, I mean, the technology exists. Like if, I'm, if, I'm, if most of my job, even with my colleagues, is done by email, then surely I can do it from wherever I want. And so that's when I thought, I went, there was, the, there was a sort of point where I thought, right, I have to make some changes in my life. I'm not particularly happy where I am. Um, and so I went to a Greek island to try out working from home on a very small Greek island. And that was now, that was April 2011. No, no, it was before then. But I finally moved to a Greek island in April 2011 and um, never looked back. Was it always in your head um, that, or when you, when you decided like, yeah, I'm going to see if I can work remotely, work from home, was it immediately like, I'm going back to Greece? Or did you kind of scan and think there's a million options? Um, at that point, I had traveled quite a lot. Um, I'd, I'd, uh, let's see, I'd, you know, over the years, I'd been to a lot of pretty out of the way places. 
um, not so much traveling, like not so much like taking off hundreds of places, but like spending a lot of time traveling in different countries. Um, I'd lived in Guyana in South America for three months. I'd lived in South Korea for three months. Um, I I'd lived in France for a couple of years. And I sort of, um, I felt that it was funny, but when I thought about what would make the next stage of my life happier, I knew that there was one thing I, I really had to do for myself. And that was just to give myself a month in Greece on my own to figure out what I wanted to do next. I think I'd done, um, I mean, I, I sort of felt like this, this, this next stage of my life wasn't about traveling so much as finding the right place for me to live. And when I thought about where I needed to be to make that decision, it had to be Greece. It had to be a Greek island. Um, and I think that was just, there was, there was just, there was no question about that. Um, I think I'd, I'd actually wanted to come back to Greece a few years before, but I'd compromised. I'd always been compromising for somebody else. And at this point I was on my own and I thought, well, what would really make you happy? Like what, what would it be that would just a pure like gift to myself? And that would be a month on a Greek island. So yes. <laughs> I love that. That's amazing. And it has been amazing. It, it, it's been, um, it's really, uh, it, it just worked out. Um, I, you know, I tested out, first of all, as I, as I say, I sort of went for a month to try it out um, and uh, found that I could do my job very happily <laughs> when I knew that I could go for a swim at lunchtime in the sea. And um, uh, and that most people, I, I was at that point, I was really only telling people on a need to know basis that I wasn't in my office in the south of England in Chichester. <laughs> <laughs> because I found that it didn't necessarily make me any friends if I told them I was on a Greek island. Um, and um, it also, also, I noticed that I was actually doing my job so happily that um, I managed to resolve a conflict happening between two of my colleagues back back in the office um you know in sort of adjacent <laughs> offices who were scrapping with one another over something and i managed to resolve that and i felt very proud of that and very happy that that was possible from far away so like from the from the, I, re I realized right away that i i could do the most interesting parts of my job well certainly a lot of the interesting parts of my job the most creative parts of my job um remotely uh, and I suppose how it's worked out gradually is that I've kept those favorite bits of the work that I used to do and built on those gradually and developed those as a freelancer um, and also have much more time to do more and more creative stuff, working with different people, working with people who really interest me um, rather than, you know, right before I was working for a company and there was always a bit of compromise there. Um, and um, and more time for writing, definitely. I mean, there's, there's no, uh, under, I, I had actually, I'd published my first book while I was still living in the UK, um, but uh, that since then, um, uh, well, after I'd been living in Greece for the first couple of years, I'm, I, I published my first book about Greece, um, and then I've published the second one just last year. Um, and that's just, I, I now know that that, that's, I'm going to be able to, that, that's now part of my life, the, um, the writing. In fact, this morning I'm finishing off, I hope, um, an article for a, a British newspaper about the place where I live. So, um, so yeah. You're awesome. If I can only find the way to finish the last paragraph, I'll be very happy. But anyway, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> uh, both of us have dabbled in writing so we definitely can understand that uh, what I was going to ask is is do you find that you're able to be much more creative living in this like very photogenic picturesque place like um, Greece yeah uh, I mean to a certain extent okay anybody you know if you if, if you if you write from the imagination then you're probably um you can write anywhere. You can write in a basement, and it's probably you know that's that if you're just coming to, coming up with stuff from your head. But I tend to be inspired by my surroundings, um, and um, I the 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 
my first book was sort of mostly um, a travel book. It was a it was a book about traveling around South Korea for three months. Um, but then the the last two books set in Greece, um, even though they're sort of in some ways classified as travel a travel memoir, they're they're very much they're not about really traveling very far at all. Um, they're, they're about sort of going nowhere very much, but observing the place around me in almost minute detail um, to. Yeah, to to conjure up a sense of place and um, and explore sort of how being in a certain place affects you as a person and affects the community that lives there. Um, so I, I love. I mean, I'm 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 very much an observer of of, of the details. Um, so yeah, definitely, I'm inspired by the place around me. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the the books that I've written are works of nonfiction, even though I try to make them into stories. Uh, with characters, um, but they are very much set in the place where I live. Um, yeah, I'm not. I don't really have a great imagination. <laughs> I don't think I could make up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've, yeah, uh, this, I, I'd like to work towards <laughs> writing fiction, but at the moment, I'm just. Uh, I get to a certain point, and I just don't understand what happens next because I haven't. You know, I I, I need to be inspired. I need to see it happening. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 that makes sense i like to sort of see get under the skin of a place a little bit <laughs> which greek island are you do you currently call home okay i i currently call home uh an island called karpathos um which is uh in the south aegean um between it's sort of at the bottom of the dodecanese islands near rhodes at halfway between Rhodes and Crete, um, if that kind of makes sense. Um, it's, I actually, I haven't, I've only been here for a year. Um, it's not the place where I originally moved to. Um, I, I actually originally moved when I decided to live in Greece. I moved to an island called Telos, which is not very far away, just on the other side of Rhodes. Um, uh, uh, a much smaller island. Um, uh, and and those are the, the two books that I've written are set in Telos. Um, uh, and I never planned to leave Telos at all. I mean, I, it's not I didn't leave there because it was too small uh, and or life was boring or anything like that. Life was never boring, even though Telos is only about six miles long and about three miles wide. I was never bored. Um, but I moved here. I came to Carpathos. As I say, I sort of every now and then I felt I should really explore some of the other islands around me because every now and then a newspaper or a magazine very kindly invites me to write, um, you know, a a sort of travel article on Greek islands. So I thought I should get to know a few more of them, uh, get some more up-to-date research. And I decided to come to the north of Karpathos, um, which is very well known for having a village called Olimbos, um, uh, which uh, known as sort of kind of one of the most, if not the most traditional villages left uh, in Greece. Um, it's uh, up on a mountain and has a lot of, it retains a lot of customs that have been lost elsewhere okay. in Greece. Yeah, that's super interesting. Yeah, I was kind of fascinated by it. And it, it's very well, it, it's, it's particularly well known for its Easter celebrations. Easter is a really big thing in Greece anyway. And Olympos has um, quite different customs um for easter so it's, it's known for that but but it's but i also wanted to come before easter because i wanted to know what life was really like um just in the winter um and whether you know it's well known that the women in olympos still wear the traditional clothes um if they're everyday clothes but i wanted to make sure i wanted to see if, if that was really true or whether they just did it for ceremonies like they do in most other places so things like that. So that's why I sort of I came to Olympos just before Easter last year, and um, <laughs> I kind of never really went home. <laughs> um, I <laughs> uh, I instantly loved the place. Uh, I was fascinated by it. It's funny actually because I'm I'm looking at a photo of you now, Amanda, um, on your Skype profile if, in front of Machu Picchu, and I've been trying to think if it's far fetched to say that Olimbos is a little bit reminiscent of Machu Picchu, but it's not. It's it's a village that's sort of clinging to a mountainside. Um, 
uh, with this sheer rock rising up behind it that sort of looks like that. Um, wow. So immediately I fell in love with the, ge- the, the geography of the place um, and the people, the, uh, the, especially the older ladies who um, you know, do wear these traditional clothes and they, they, uh, they're very, um, a very forthcoming, sort of uh, very strong women. Uh, so I loved all that, and then I also the the, <laughs> the man um, who owned the rooms where I was staying, a uh, chap called Minas, uh, said he had a savona um, also down a little far away from the village in a, an empty valley um, where all the people keep their olive trees. So it's got hundreds and hundreds of olive trees in this valley, um, and there's a beautiful beach that is quite wild with nothing on it. Um, and he had this taverna that was set back from the beach and that um, that I should come and visit. Um, so I went, to, I thought one day I went for a big hike and I went down to this beach. And um, as I was swimming, I went for a swim and it was glorious. Like, some of the, one of the most beautiful beaches I've ever seen. And uh, I went, I was swimming and the, as I was swimming, this fishing boat came gliding in. And it was his friend Stamatis, and we had this play. They decided, right, we're going to have fresh fish tonight cooked up on the barbecue, and we'll sit and eat and drink ouzo under the stars, which is all incredibly romantic. Uh, and uh, Mina said, well, I'm actually looking for a little bit of help at my taverna during the summer, so maybe you could think of coming to live here for the summer. Uh and I thought, well, I, I, it would be an amazing experience, um, but I can't. I thought, you know, I have a, I have a life back in Telos. I have a job. I have a dog. I have, but he said, no, well, give it a try. You know what? And it just seemed like something I had to do. Um, and so <laughs> now I'm actually. That's where I'm talking to you from. Um, Minas and now, uh, Minas and I are now together we're a couple <laughs> and um uh we had and the uh, my dog came over to join us and uh, so i went back finally finally i was i decided to i had to give up my thing my life in telos and bring everything here and and um, make it permanent wow that's really cool. that's really cool yeah that's that's such a picturesque story <laughs> <laughs> i was talking to you from the the sort of this taverna surrounded by fig trees and olive trees in a very a valley that is currently full of flowers and when I say full of flowers like you can't really walk anywhere without treading on flowers orchids poppies everything um and um with this and the sea is sort of glittering down at the bottom at the end of the field of olive trees and that's and that's 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 life here right now in Carpathos yes that's a long answer to your story, <laughs> to your question. Anyway. Yeah. Is there, a, I think from the outside, people talk about the Greek islands and you kind of imagine them being like this, having a lot, a lot in common. Are there a lot of differences from island to island? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, I mean, obviously, the, um, I, <laughs> uh, I, I, I find that even though there are things in common, like every island I've been to is it, its own small world. Um, there are there uh, everything. Every place has its own feel, and so people say, "Well, which is your favourite Greek island?" And I don't think that I think that's quite a difficult thing to say because they're all they all have their own spirit and character. Weirdly, because I mean, there are, there are thousands of islands and hundreds that are populated. Um, but the, there are there are islands that are great for different reasons. Um, uh, yeah. So I mean, obviously, the, you know, there are things that are. I think it's be, I, yeah. I, I mean, I suppose it's because they were so remote and so cut off from one another, and still are to a certain extent in the winter. Um, you know, you really do get a sense of being on an island in the winter. If you, if you, when you travel in the Greek islands in the summer, you know, you can hop to the next one when you fancy and, um, and you know, go to, uh, you know, travel around a little bit. Whereas in the winter, 
um, the you can get quite severe storms, which yeah, then if there's a big storm, the boat might not come, and it might not come for a week or two weeks. Um, and uh, you really are just sort of hunkering down on this rock <laughs> in the middle of the sea, um, and you notice that uh, uh, you know you don't have the same uh, supplies. You might you have to get quite um, quite adjusted to island life in that respect. Um, but yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's hard. It's hard to. It, it's 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 hard to characterize what makes a one island different from another. I suppose it's the people. Uh, the, the, you know, for example, the the um, the geography as well. I mean, why is Carpet Carpet is halfway between Rhodes and Crete? Now, Rhodes and Crete are probably two of the most developed islands when it comes to tourism but they're two of the most the biggest destinations i suppose when it comes to tourists in greece um uh, and that doesn't mean that they're completely spoiled by any means but there are vast swathes of both islands that are full of big hotels and so on um and yet carpathos in the middle of them uh is really quite unspoiled um it's it, there are some sort of low-key kind of resorts in the south of the island there's an airport you know there's a town in the south of the island which has you know modern conveniences but it's not been um it's not really built up it doesn't it feels still quite remote and um certainly in the north of the island it feels quite uh, back in time um uh, and I think maybe, maybe it's partly geography that determines that as well, because it's very, very rugged. Um, the you know the road up to this the north part of Carpathos was only only be, only became an asphalted road in, within I don't, know, I don't know something like a decade ago. Um, oh wow! Uh, and you know a few days ago you, you you know because the you know there was big rainstorm here because. Um, we we were meaning we planned to talk then, didn't we? And there was a big rainstorm, and we couldn't. Um, the, after the storm, there were rock slides that covered <laughs> part of the road, the main road to the south, and um, the like big boulders sort of <laughs> um, blocking the road uh, that had to be cleared. And when I came here last last year, around this time of year. Um, the port in the north here, the Afani, uh, had been destroyed by a storm and had, couldn't be used. So, right. so you can see how uh, an area, a place, can become quite cut off. Um, to the extent that you know, like it's it's a really, it can be a pretty tough place to live. I mean, there's no in the north of the island here. There's no petrol station. There's no bank. The post office is um, a a, ch- a chap. Called Yanis, who has animal, who who's sort of a farmer and um, also owns a souvlaki shop. And if you want to, do better, he'll you can just give it to him, and he'll take it down to town next time he's going. Um, so it's you know it's this it, there's no doctor. Um, it's 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 pretty pretty cut off, uh, and there's a lot of you know there's a lot of uh, you know it didn't used to be like that in the. Um, you know, only a generation or two back, there were it was much more populated. But gradually, as you know, people people look for an easier life elsewhere. So they might go to Rhodes, they might go to Athens, and it's become quite uh, empty um, in this part of the island. So uh, yeah, I mean, it, there's a lot of different factors that that determine, I suppose, why why one island might have a different character from another. Um, in, in infrastructure has a lot to do with it, I guess. Yeah, it sounds like life on the Greek islands can be challenging at some points. Um, How long has it taken you to, or how long did it take you to adjust to sort of like the slow moving life, like, you know, having like mother nature just really control things at some points? (laughs) Yeah, Um, I think my first, my first winter, I just, even though I felt, um, I felt pretty well traveled, a pretty um, worldly person who could be prepared for anything. I I wasn't 
I, I, the first winter, I think, was tough. Um, I didn't, you know, when um, when I was told, well, there's a lot of rain in winter, I had an umbrella. Well, an umbrella is completely useless when it rains on a, on, a, on one of these islands because um, it's like the the like what actually happens is all the rain that would sort of like it would they would take say a month to come down in England it comes down in a few hours <laughs> on one of these islands um, it just it's absolute torrential rain and wind you, the umbrella is destroyed pretty quickly what you really need is a very good pair of rubber boots um so silly things like that i wasn't prepared for also the, the houses aren't um obviously aren't heated very well because they don't need to be most of the time but for the few days a year when it's cold it's really really cold um so you do need to be prepared with um you know to i that, so uh, i'm afraid to say after my first year i did make sure I had a very good duvet and a hot water <laughs> bottle and lots of warm socks because I don't <laughs> like the cold. Um, uh, silly things. Like, and, and also, like I think in my first year, I did crave quite a lot of foods. I, 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 and it's embarrassing to say so because you think, oh, no, I'm just going to go completely native in my first year. But no, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you do, <laughs> I did crave certain flavours and I sort of thought, you know, I thought... Um, I, I thought, you know, I'd have to get a good supply of certain foods in that made me feel at home. But actually, after my first year, that went away, and I started um, adapting a lot more to the to the to the um, to what was available and uh, and and loving what was available. Uh, I think it's just it's just a question of learning how you can create new flavors. I mean, food's quite an important thing to me, um, and. Uh, one of the things that uh, I started to love doing is to look forward to certain seasons when certain foods become available. Um, so, uh, in the spring, it might be um, it might be a certain herbs that start growing, or um, capers capers that grow by the by the seashore that can be gathered around uh, sort of May time. Um, the figs are just beginning to grow. Um, and you really look forward to those seasons. And you, I, I find that because you have an abundance of things in those seasons when they become available, I don't crave them the rest of the year um, because I know that we'll have them again, you know, next summer. Um, and in the same way, I, now, I, I mean, I've, I've comp- one way that I realised that I was really adapting to small island life was that um, uh, if I go... If I go to the shop and um, there's, there's, you know, there's very little fresh produce in the shop because there hasn't been a deli- new delivery because a boat hasn't come. Um, in a way, it, it, it makes you very resourceful and it, it takes away the, the, the sort of the, the difficult thing of choice because you just sort of see what they have and you make something from that. Um, and so, and when... Um, I remember the moment when the, my little shop in Telos where I was living before suddenly got fresh mushrooms for the first time in months. And it was such a joy having fresh mushrooms. And I just thought, isn't that a lovely thing? That you can, that <laughs> most people who live in big cities don't even think, wouldn't even think twice about it. But now I, I got such pleasure out of that. Whereas now if I go back to England and I'm going around the supermarket with my mum and she says well choose what you want for dinner and I just look around a big supermarket and I I can't choose (laughs) it's just too I feel like I don't know where to start I mean I just think how do people I can't understand how I don't think I could live like that anymore Um, when you can have everything (laughs) uh, it's too much so actually now I, I prefer I prefer lack of choice. I find it much more um, like liberating. <laughs> um, um, and there's a lot, of, you know, you, you can make do with so many fewer things when you live um, when you live in a place like this. Um, so, sorry, just to go back to your original question, I think I may have veered off it slightly. You were saying that, um, you know, how long did I? I think you were saying how long did it take to adapt? I mean, it's not. You, I think you mentioned a sort of slower pace of life, and it's. Um, what I find 
for me is that I'm I, I'm still waiting for the slow time. Um, there hasn't been one really, and I and I think one of the things one of the um, uh, you, there's definitely a sense of living with the seasons very much and I and I love that I love that awareness of like of you know certain things coming in certain seasons and, and life changing with that um, but it, it's I think it, maybe it's my personality that I'm always taking on interesting new things to do but I've never I've never experienced a time where I don't have loads to do and I think that's partly because I came here not to retire as a lot of people a lot of people certainly British people when they move to Greece they they retire here they buy a house and they come here to retire and have a slower pace of life whereas for me it wasn't like that at all it was it's to it was to um continue with my work um maybe if I had the money I'd just buy a place and not work again but but <laughs> I came here to um develop my career in a way so now I'm probably I, because I have my own business. Um, I'm working really hard, but I'm enjoying it. It doesn't feel like work all the time. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, there's always something interesting to do, whether it's my own work, um, and there's various aspects to my own work, um, or whether it's helping my partner with like getting the taverna ready, getting the the, the our little hotel ready. For the season, um, uh, you know, meeting uh, visitors, um, or you know, or, or whether it's going out to gather a certain berry that's just growing this, you know, in this season, Get, going to explore another part of the island. You know, there's so many walks I want to do. So, <laughs> yeah, um, life is busy, but in the best, very, it's full, in the in the best possible way. Yeah, yeah, that's really, really cool to hear. When you kind of hinted at it a little bit in relation to the food, but I'm curious if there's any other parts of living in England that you miss being in Greece. Um, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but I think that's partly because I haven't lived in England my whole life. Um, uh, I've lived in, you know, I, I left England pretty much after I finished university. Or immediately after I finished university, I went to live in Greece for a year. Then I lived in T Toronto. Then I lived in Montpellier. Then I lived back in England, but in a place where I didn't grow up for, for work. Um, so I've always, I've, I've traveled around a lot. And so I don't feel like super English. Um, and I can, I'm, you can tell that from my accent as well, I know. Um, I... Uh, <laughs> I, um, I miss obviously you know I miss I miss friends and family and that's always that yeah that's it even though I'm in touch with them all the time I know that um, I, I, it gets to a certain point when I haven't seen people for a while that I do I miss friends and family in terms of life in England I'm not saying I don't like it because I do I think I suppose if there was anything there were certain you know um, <laughs> There were certain things that I wish happened differently in Greece. Um, I, I like uh, the I like the British. You know, the, in Britain, there's a certain care for the environment, which sadly doesn't really happen in Greece yet. Um, I, I, I know that sounds weird, but I just I just mean um, sort of yeah, pollution-wise, like plastic pollution and so on. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I understand that from spending two months in Bali before this. Like, I absolutely love the island of Bali. But I'm like, this is one of the most beautiful places in the world. Why are you throwing garbage on the side of the road or burning it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. like, And that's just, uh, I, yeah, that's, uh, hopefully that's just, it'll just be a matter of time. And the, the thing is, it's hard to, um, you know, there's so much awareness in a place in, in, in the UK, in Canada, about um, you know things that we should do to respect our environment, um, and it's hard to like I, the Greek islands have a lot of other things to deal with right now. Um, obviously, there's huge economic problems. Um, 
if on an island like Telos or an island like Carpathos, um, where they don't have a doctor and people are dying because there isn't a doctor, then it's really hard to sort of nag people about not throwing, you know, not collecting too many plastic bags or plastic bottles. Um, you know, there are other concerns that, um, that that are that are pretty major, and that's you know that's that's all linked to the economy. Um, and also, you know, there's been and on a lot of these islands. There's also been an additional strain on the economy because on the on way of life because of refugees coming in um, uh, to the islands that are close to the Turkish border. So there's a, there's a there's a lot of other stuff. But but on but the th- one yeah, I mean it, it's difficult because the Greek because the islands more than the mainland um, have a reasonably okay way of life in spite of economic difficulty purely because of tourism um and therefore um you sort of wish that people would realize that um uh it, it's that it's you know that, that's keeping the environment you know looking after the environment that the tourists come for would be is, is a good thing <laughs> Um, the, it, the main problem is because there is there is no infrastructure for recycling, um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't want to make too big a deal of this, but yeah, it's so uh, there is I don't, I don't like I don't like plastic very much personally. <laughs> yeah, uh, so to, sh- to sh- shift gears a little bit into into writing, um, one yeah. question I have is. For someone who you've lived a very adventurous life, gone to, you know, lived in a number of different countries and had a number of different stories, how do you know when when an experience is worthy of a book? Or how do you pick out, you know, obviously mm-hmm. moving to Greece, there's a number of stories. How do you find out like, oh, these are the, the stories that should are worth me writing a book about? Gosh, that's a really interesting question, <laughs> and I think yeah, because 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 um, uh, that's kind of, that's uh, that's been my a lot of my work for the last say ten years uh, or so because I I I, I w- my as an editor I also advise writers um, and try to get books published um, that are sort of travel related books. So how do you decide what's worth telling? It's always changing. You're, you're trying to find a story that hasn't been told in a, that particular way, uh, and a story that's a, a message that's worth sharing. My first book, which is about traveling around South Korea, the decisions that went into writing that, I mean, for a start, I was just, as I was traveling, this was in the year 2000 when I traveled around South Korea. And um, it was a very interesting time for that country because there was meetings happening between North and South that seemed to be groundbreaking um, at the time. There was an optimism, which perhaps, I don't know, when you, when you look at the situation now, it's, it's a little, you, you worry what happened to that time. But, but at the time, there was an optimism about what's happening. And the country seemed to be, South Korea was sort of opening up to... Um, visitors from the west but still hadn't seen many of them so uh as i was traveling around the country i was meeting people who'd never had um a westerner in their village before and uh who who were inviting me into their homes and i was sort of i felt like i was having extraordinary experiences that certainly like nothing like i'd ever encountered before so it wasn't just i wasn't just going to a famous site and commenting on that it was that i would end up spending the nights in a monastery in the mountains uh completely unexpectedly or yeah as they say invited to stay in somebody's house and uh, we couldn't communicate but somehow like in language but we somehow managed to communicate and i and i would learn something very intimate about this part of the country or you know i'd be yeah yeah there was so so I felt like the, there were certain stories that had to be told, and they were beautiful, and they were um, they helped to reveal the country to me um, in a way that I wouldn't have. What I found, what I was finding, that traveling as a single female around the country 
was giving me experiences that I didn't have when I was traveling with my then boyfriend. Um, somehow, sort of, if you were a couple, you were fine on your own. But suddenly, as a, as a, it was partly be female, but partly on your own, that just didn't like. It wasn't. It was seen as something really pitiable. <laughs> it's like, oh, how can you be on your own? We must look after you. Um, and so, and I, so, I felt that I was. Um, I felt that the, there was there were stories there that were worth telling, and it was because everything in the news, everything you ever read about Korea was about the North. And I thought, well, well, why? Because the North is a place that we can't really travel properly. We can't understand it. We, we, you're not even now. You're not really allowed to travel around to the North of Korea without being accompanied by a guide who points out the the official site, official things to, to look at. Um, uh, whereas in the, the South was this incredibly beautiful, welcoming, peaceful um, uh, country, I mean, extraordinarily welcoming, where people went out of their way to look after you. And I felt like, well, this this has this should be written about. And nobody had written a book for for twenty years. Simon Winchester's was the one. There was the previous book about travel around South Korea. So I thought there was a there was enough reason for there to be a book about that. If that makes sense. Did you go in? Did you go into that trip thinking I'm going to write a book about this, or was it just a, a trip? And then while you were there, the idea came about. I didn't know I was going to write a book. I'd, I'd never written a book before, um, but I knew sort of how to go about it because because I'd always been interested in travel books. Um, so it just sort of developed from uh, writing down the stories. Um, some of the stories that just just came to me, and it was just they, some of them were just so good. It was just effortless. I was just having this experience, thinking, "What a story this is!" <laughs> and, um, <laughs> yeah, so it would just come out, and then sort of, I, I you know I I published a couple of the stories, and then finally found the time to keep writing and keep writing until I had until I had a sort of manuscript that was kind of book length and I was like I'm going to try I'm going to see if anybody likes it so I sent it out I actually yeah I sent it to by that time by the time I'd finished writing that sort of 70,000 words um, I was working for Summersdale Publishers in the UK editing travel books so I was able to give the manuscript to my then boss and say um, is it any good and he said well not <laughs> it's not going to sell it's not going to sell in huge numbers but um, because South Korea is still a fairly niche place to go, um, but uh, but he said you know he he thought it was well, thought it was worth publishing. Um, so that was that. Those were the, the, there has to be certain factors, I suppose, that make it a story worth telling, and also a story that people are going to buy. There has to be a reason why people are going to buy it. So so when I saw when, when it came to writing about Greece. Um, my first book uh, about Greece is called Falling in Honey. And um, it was really about my decision to make a change in my life. Um, and, it's, and at the same time about falling in love with an island. Um, and I think it just that, that those those things sort of spoke to a lot of people. Uh, every, you know, it's that sort of you know, I laid everything there at the beginning. It's like life was pretty bad. Life was pretty bleak. So I go on holiday to this Greek island with this guy, and we have a great time. And then he dumps me, and um, I'm really upset about it. But but really upset. I mean, why am I so upset? It's because I'm not happy in myself. So I have to decide um, what what I want out of life because I'm not making myself happy. So it was kind of also that it was really much about like, how do you change, you know, get a hold of your life and make it better. Um, and it was about those things that I did to make life better. And the, the most, the main one being going back to that island and, and, um, and seeing if I could make a life there. Um, so yeah, it was, I think that, I, you know, I sort of, Again, you just never know, do you, when you write a story, but you, you hope that there's something in there that will speak to people in some way. I think what I, what I hoped was that there's a lot of books about moving to Greek islands, 
but most of them, as I say, are by people who have got some money and they're ret close to retirement and they buy a house that's falling apart and they do it up. <laughs> and uh, my, my story wasn't that in any way. Um, uh, and I also felt like I had a real history with Greece that, uh, that helped me to, yeah, to, 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 to meet a lot of people. Also speaking the language as well, you know, sort of, I, I was really meeting people and, um, trying to just sort of dig below the surface a little bit. Um, yeah, that's really interesting to hear. And I, I'm interesting, I'm interested to hear what the feeling was like when you, because you worked in publishing for years and years and you obviously have a passion for writing. Like when you finally published your first book and you got that copy of that book in your hand, like what did that feel like for you? <laughs> um, there's nothing like it. Uh, it still gives me a massive thrill when anything of mine is published. Um, there's always the next frontier, you know, like the next... Um, you think, well, I'll be satisfied if I if I ever get a story, you know, a story of mine in the Times newspaper, and then you do it and you go, but I I need to work harder. A, a, a book is, I suppose, more lasting, isn't it? Because even though there was, I suppose, uh, yeah, there's something thrilling about your first book, about about holding that object in your hands. Um, but I think more thrilling for me, and maybe I've become a bit blase about it because I, because I work with books and because I've published a few books now, but um, the more thrilling thing is sort of when you get messages from people you don't know, people, complete strangers all over the world. No, you know, well, I've had messages, yeah, I tend to get messages from people in, in the UK, in Australia, in the US, Canada. Um, Poland, or oh, because because some of my books are now, like published in different languages as well. Poland, uh, but messages from people just saying um, thank you for writing this. I, I loved it, and and that that's that's the huge that, that really just makes my day, makes my week, makes it encourages me to do more. I love that. I love feeling that you've connected with somebody and you've, you've your story has spoken to somebody. Um, there was one. I, I just. I have. This, what, there was one message I got. It's about a month ago now, and it really, really stuck with me. Um, there was a woman who uh, her family were from Greece. Um, she was born in Greece, I think. And then when she was little, her her family went to Australia for to sort of make a living. And um, so she grew up in Australia. She got married. She's got children. And then all her family moved back to Greece, her parents. And so she goes back to Greece once a year to visit the country that she loves, that her, now her family live in. Um, but her life is in Australia. Her, you know, her, her, her family, her own family, her husband and her children are in Australia. And she misses Greece and her, so much. And she would love to live there. And so she found my book in the in the airport, and she just said thank you because you transport me back to the country that I love. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it's very moving, very moving. Um, but you know, there's yeah, there's loads of reasons why a travel book gets published. Um, sometimes it's because somebody's done something extraordinary. I, I work a lot with people who um, do extraordinary journeys. Like I've, uh, there's a chap called Casper Craven, who um, is one of my clients, whose book I just I just helped him to place his book with Bloomsbury in the U.S. and the U.K. And his story is about how um, he just, he and his wife decided that they wanted to sail around the world. They didn't have a boat at the time. Um, his wife actually got seasick when she went out, you know, away, uh, she couldn't see land anymore. But they really wanted to sail around the world with their children who were aged at the, uh, by the time they set off. And they planned this. I mean, they didn't just do it lightheartedly. They spent, did a lot of planning, but they decided this is what they wanted to do. When they set off, their children were aged nine seven and two wow <laughs> and um most, most people would have just said well we'll do it when the kids are kids are older but they decided no like let's, we want to do it now we want to give these experiences to our children now and live these things with our children um and so you know uh it was something quite special um quite magical that they wanted to do 
so I, I work a lot with people like sure. that, people like that, who uh, I suppose a lot of it is about proving what's possible. Um, uh, uh, deciding that that why why live an ordinary life that you're not particularly happy with when you can do something extraordinary if you put your mind to it um so i tend i do work quite a lot with people who've done interesting things um who want to go out and see the world partly because so i suppose a lot of people a lot of the, people, the thing that drives people is uh, why not what are you waiting for mm -hmm. Nobody's going to do it for you, and I mean, for, for me, one of the driving things was uh, I kept thinking, well, I'd love to live on a Greek island, but you know, the time's not right. You know, maybe I should wait till I've got some more money, or until I'm better better in my job, or this or that. And then two people who um, I knew who were in their 60s died of cancer, and. Uh, uh, it just made me wake up and just go, just go for it. What are you waiting for? You know, one of these, one, one of these friends was somebody whose uh, his wife was from Thailand, and they they always thought that if in a few more years they were going to close the pub that they ran and they were going to go and live on the beach in Thailand, and now they were never going to do that together. So um, it really made me think. Um, yeah, life's too short not to uh, reach out for what makes you happy. Yeah, yeah, and definitely. that's something we've found with basically everyone we've talked to on the show is you have some sort of vision for a better life or a dream and it it's really murky like you don't know if it's going to work out it's probably not the you know the best time to do it but just like stepping out and doing it even though you don't know if it's going to work out and then it usually ten usually just tends to work out the solutions present themselves afterwards yeah because like um what's the worst that could happen you go home yeah it's back where you started <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah if you you'll just never know if you don't try it and most people do sort of make it work i mean i suppose those are the people the people that you talk to are the people who've made yeah, it yeah. work <laughs> we don't talk to the other ones <laughs> Let's pretend they don't exist but, yeah but the, 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 the you know if you if people don't people who don't make it work are probably people who find out that they actually don't like it after all i think usually you you'll find a way if you want something enough Maybe I mean you. It's it's work. It it is work. Like there there are people who sort of have said to me, "I'd love to do what you do. I think I'm going to come and live in your village." And I just <laughs> you know, like you you wouldn't like it um, because there there are there are things that you give up, aren't there? Um, you know, you have the glorious to to have the wonderful experiences. You also have to give up a lot of creature comforts. Uh, a lot of the time. I mean, you know, they say you, you have to very often kind of get rid of everything you own uh, and um, make a leap to a place that might be a bit uncomfortable at first. But then you, I think you soon adapt to a different way of life. And actually, uh, living without clutter is a great thing. Yeah, um, yeah definitely. <laughs> you know, I mean, did you find, like, when you pack up all that stuff in boxes and leave it in storage and then you forget about it <laughs> it's like if you you know you probably don't need it in fact all that stuff that's in storage yeah, um, yeah we like, we definitely had that experience like coming home from two big six month backpacking trips like both times we left our stuff in storage and we came back and I, I remember the second time we didn't even have a big storage unit like probably one of the smallest storage units that you can even get and being like, why do we yeah. have two sets of golf clubs when we never golf? <laughs> why do we have tennis rackets that we like we we don't play tennis? Like, why do we even own tennis rackets? And like, why do we have pots and pans that are literally worthless? Like, why are we paying to store things that it's going to like cost us more to store than it would be to just buy new like IKEA pots and pans? <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. So th this time we've gone storage unit free and. Got got rid of all that stuff. We have we have a bit of stuff stored yeah, at our parents' there's a, there's house. there's some stuff. We should not just act basement. like we only have backpacks. <laughs> I mean, there's suddenly there's sort there's sort of things like uh, there's certain things that sometimes I wish that um, they would be destroyed by a flood or something. You know, paperwork that you think, well, I can't get rid of it. Um, <laughs> but it's, but it's, it's ca casual flooding in the basement. <laughs> 
<sighs> yes, I know. Unfortunately, because I, in in the UK, if I was in the UK, I would just give stuff to a charity shop. Um, because you know, when I was moving out here, I gave so much stuff to charity shops. But there aren't charity shops on a Greek island, so you just hang on to things just in case. You think, well, I can't really just throw it away. Um, so um, you kind of hang on to stuff a little bit longer, I think. Um, yeah. But it's, 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 I'd rather just declutter my life. It's so, yeah, it's a lot more simple. Yeah, that's an interesting point, I guess. That's another thing that you don't really think about, like living on an island. It's one of those things that we totally take for van- take for granted when you live in a big city is something as simple as like the Salvation Army. Yeah. Um, I mean, for a while, you used to be able to give, uh, <laughs> you used to give bags of old clothes to the church and they would give them to worthy causes. But I think that's all got really kind of confused with the whole refugee situation. There's just so many people giving so much stuff, and I think there are probably like landfills full of donated clothing um, that's just uh, that's really you know can't be used. So um, yeah, it's it's not worth worrying about. I just try not to acquire too much stuff. That's the thing at the very like, Yeah, I, I'll go if I go to Athens or I go to London, and I you know. I'm not really a big shopper, but when I see something beautiful, I think, oh, those shoes, got it. I love those shoes, but I'm never going to wear them because I live in a field. So <laughs> those, <laughs> you know, it, it, it helps to, it helps me a little bit to decide like, like you know, my mom says, go on, I'll buy it for you, I'll buy it for you. Mom, I'm never, ever going to wear it. No, thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah. I, I can relate to that experience as well. Like, so going to Bali for a couple months, it's like they sell all different types of like kind of locally made products. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I love all this stuff. Like I want to buy it. And then I'm like, I know I'll wear none of this when I'm not on like the island of Bali. <laughs> like I will never use it again. It'll just sit there. And then it's the reverse of coming to somewhere like Kuala Lumpur with all these like really nice luxury malls and feeling yeah. super spoiled by all of this like cool international stuff that's around and being like oh like there's jeans and there's bras and there's you know there's zara and all this nice stuff and then being like i'm not gonna wear any of this either like i already own enough clothing like just just stop you don't need anything amanda (laughs) yeah yeah the the only thing is that sometimes when i I go to london because for meetings i do you know even though i work for home um because i work with publishers and, and authors, um, when I go, I sort of have to go back to the UK a couple of times a year and have meetings with clients. And I sort of, well, there's always the first moment when I get back and I sort of see my, catch myself in the mirror of a shop thinking, oh gosh, do I look like that? I really need to buy something new to wear. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you sort of, you do have that um, tendency just to, to throw on you know it's almost like sort of that that cliche of working in your pajamas all day but it's not quite like that but uh, you know uh, um I, I need to brush my hair sometimes if i'm in london you know it's not quite the same as living next to the beach yeah yeah definitely <laughs> And so we want to be mindful of your time. Um, I just have one more question for you. And I'm curious if anyone is listening and they're like, yes, like I have a travel story I want to tell, or I I have this idea for a book that I've just been sitting on. What's like one piece of advice that you would give those listeners, you know, to kind of get them started? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think what. Uh, one thing that a lot of people don't do um, that is pretty necessary these days is to find out um, f- find out what it is that you're trying to write and um, uh, see what other people are doing that's like that. Um, this, uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of people come to me and say, well, I've written something... I've written this travel book, and it's a bit like Bill Bryson. Um, Bill Bryson uh, is one of the sort of best-known fam- best household names in travel writing, but he hasn't written a book, travel book in probably about a decade, and um, he actually wasn't famous until about his fifth book. Um, 
he became famous purely by fluke, I think, because he wrote a book about England. So um, a lot of people haven't researched their genre. And it's really important to see what's out there, what people have already done, um, where you, what you might be doing that's totally different from what's already available. Um, and why it should be a book, why, why is, um, why is, why is, what's this going to give to somebody um, that they can't get from reading a blog for free? So what's the, what's the big story that you have to tell that you really have to share with people? Um, and just find a way to, to sum that up. It's a really difficult thing to do. I mean, I thought it, it, it feels easy to me because I've been doing it for years, but, but it isn't. And, you know, the, the, the information is all out there now online in a way that's much easier than it was years ago uh, because so many people shop for books online. Um, so it, it's possible to research. You just have to look, for, look in the right place. I mean, obviously, Amazon is a really good place to start. Um, uh, and just, uh, but there are also forums out there for other people. You know, if, if you're interested in travel memoir, there are lots of travel memoir writers uh, groups on Facebook, on um, on Goodreads, and so on. So kind of try to figure out um, what it is you want to write, and and uh, how people are doing that, and how how yours can be different. And then if you think you've got something really special uh have a look for my website <laughs> which do, <laughs> um, my i have i have two i run two blogs i don't have a sort of fancy website i do them both as blogs so that i can update them all the time i have my own personal blog which um which is for my books and my writing and that's called an octopus in my Uzo. Um, which is also the title of my most recent book. Um, but my, and my other blog is my work blog, um, which uh, my the two aspects like, like the the two aspects of the kind of the day job I suppose that I do are editing manuscripts, making them polishing them, making them ready to present to publishers and agents, and also representing authors. If I feel that a, a book is ready to sell to a publisher, then I can also try and help an author to get that book published. And that blog is just called um, Jennifer Barclay Books. And so, yeah, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'll be able to help. Okay, cool. Yeah, you, you, just, <laughs> you just snagged our last question, which was where can people go to find you? So <laughs> if anyone out there <laughs> listening is interested in your books or your editing services or has a book that they want Jen to check out, definitely reach out to her. Um, thank you so much for your time today. I know that you guys just had a storm in Greece and it's been <laughs> such a hassle with internet. So thank you so much for making the time to talk with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. It's been lovely talking to you both. To find more information, relevant links, and photos talked about in this week's episode, check out theworldwanderers.com. If you have a question, comment, or feedback, send us an email at info at theworldwanderers.com. Join our community on Facebook at The World Wanders or on Twitter at WorldWanders1. As always, thanks so much for listening. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.